rather than being out on the field as a more of an internal spotlight. And sometimes it's in the moment, in the present, where it needs to be. Sometimes it's thinking ahead, what's to come. Sometimes your spotlight's gone behind, but it's always somewhere. So rather than kind of seeing concentration as something that you have at times or you lose, it, it's always there, it's a skill. What we need to be able to do is grab hold of the controls for our spotlight. Welcome to the Elevate Podcast. I'm your host and coach, Tyler Johnson. Thank you for tuning in. If you are a return listener, I'd be grateful for your rating or review. And if you dig this episode, give us a like or share. And now, whether you've tuned in to elevate your mindset, your game, or just your day, you are in the right place. My guest this episode is a professor in sport and exercise psychology. He has held lecturing positions at several UK universities and most recently was the head of psychology at Mary Immaculate College. His primary research interests are in mental toughness, stress, and coping, where he has contributed to many publications and books and delivered conference talks all around the globe. As a practitioner, he has vast experience working with sports teams and individuals, including professional golf and soccer. Welcome to the Elevate Podcast, Dr. John Perry. John, how are you doing today? I'm, I'm great, thanks, TJ. Yeah, yeah. How are you? I'm good. I'm excited to have you on. Uh, your, your book I got here, uh, I think one of the, it's just one of the greatest, you know, as it says, complete introduction to sports psychology. So excited to have you on the podcast to share some knowledge. Yes. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's great to be talking to you. And um, I, I suppose one of the things I, I tried to do with that book, and I, I hopefully I'll be starting a second edition pretty soon, is um, just try and take the complicated things but explain them in a simple way, and that's kind of that's kind of what I've what I've what I've tried to do with all of my work since I since yeah. I started this kind of academic route. Well, I think you, you do that well. I, I work with a lot of you know younger student athletes, and you know making these concepts and skills palatable and tangible to them in a simple way is the best way to get them to test them, try them out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you know, what kind of led you into this work, John, originally, what got you fascinated with it? Uh, well, I always loved sport um, and like many people who study sport at university, I love sport. I would have given anything to be a footballer or a soccer player, you would say, at the, mm. uh, but I just wasn't good enough. So the next best thing was studying it, right? Um, and my, my first job, I did a master's straight after my degree. So I did sports science and psychology as, a, as like a joint on us. Um, my first job in, in professional football was as a performance analyst. And now performance analysis has come a long way since this is kind of what, about 17 years ago. Um, but I spent ages, ages clicking on dots on a screen. And then I'd have a conversation with players and coaches. And after a couple of months, I thought, it's the conversation that's making the difference here, not the analysis. And at that point, I thought, yeah, I, I always liked the psychology. I like the performance analysis. I like the biomechanics. I'm like, but I was, no, it's, it's the psychology, I think, is where I can, that's where I can have the, the biggest impact. And you hear so often people talk about those marginal gains, those extra few percent that might be the difference between sure. success and failure. And I, I, I've never seen psychology that way, to be honest. I, I think compared to, other areas that I've worked in, I think, no, I, I think I can actually make a big impact, not just a few percent. You know, I can give people some, some skills that not only could they use to get those extra few percent in a performance setting, but they just get more out of what they spend so much of their lives doing. And it's sure. so much more fulfilling. So I, from, from that moment on, I've kind of always, uh, always take such, such an interest in it. Yeah, no, that's a cool path. I love it. Uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask you is, uh, 
you do a great job talking about mental toughness. What's one of the greatest myths about mental oh. toughness or misconceptions? There's, there's a few, there's a few out there and um, in with, without plugging too many books, but I recently co-authored a book, Developing Mental Toughness, third edition uh, with Doug Strahachik and Peter Club. Uh, and we actually opened by talking about some of the myths in, in that book. Um, I think probably the one that if, if I had the power to dispel one, it would be the way that people understand mental toughness to be this kind of macho man up don't show your emotion you know you just just get on with it and get over it and right and and that's entirely uh, inaccurate compared to like our, our empirical understanding of of what mental toughness is which grew out of health psychology and mental toughness is positively associated with well-being and it's negatively associated with anxiety and stress and depressive symptoms and burnout and uh, my sort of friend and colleague professor peter clough who's a big name in mental yeah. toughness he, uh, he he would always say two things that that all stick with me first of all like it takes a real man to cry <laughs> right agree and uh, and and secondly um, I, defining mental toughness as being comfortable in your own skin. Now, I like that. I really like that as a definition because um, that enables us to think, do you know what? Being tough isn't about not having insecurities, not feeling anxious, not feeling fearful. It's about still feeling all those things, but yeah. being comfortable with it. Yeah. And, and say, hey, that's, that's why I do it. I put yeah. myself in these positions playing competitive and hopefully elite sport because I want to experience some of those things yeah. and, I, I, and I push myself. And uh, so I, I think now that my understanding of mental toughness there is the complete opposite direction to this. It's about being really macho and manning up and not complaining. And, right. Yeah. It, no, I, I completely agree. A, a friend and a, a guy I've had on the podcast, who's a, in the elite, you know, military here in the U S with green beret and trained Navy seals. And I asked him one day, I said, he threw me off guard a little bit. I said, you know, how do you define mental toughness? And he's told me it's your ability and the amount you love yourself. Yeah, that's a great answer. Yeah. And, you know, and I think from, you know, speaking to this guy that went through some of these, these, you know, military macho, elite endeavors it was it caught me off guard but it always stuck with me so i think you know just as you kind of said in a, a different form yeah I, I think that's someone who's clearly got a a genuine awareness you know that's someone who's really reflected on it rather than thinking hey i did it so others should <laughs> yeah yeah he, for sure he has he's definitely a, a fascinating guy as well uh one of the things we got a lot of coaches and student athletes that listen to this what are some of the maybe the lack of better terms, low hanging fruit or a couple of the things that we can help young student athletes to develop uh, mental toughness with what mm -hmm. are some of those, those key things that we can impact as coaches. Yeah. And, uh, and th those things that you might consider low hanging fruit actually become the most effective stuff because if they're, if they become habits, right. You can't get to the just... top of the tree without the lower part, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> And uh, one, one of the things I, I say to, to, to all performers, especially in team sports, is um, before, you, before you engage in any kind of activity, whether it's training, whether it's turning up for a match, whether it's a meeting, just pause and ask yourself, what's the best version of myself I can bring to this? You know, spend that extra 60 seconds in the car before you get out at the training ground. What's the best version of myself I can bring to this? And that's not to say that you're always going to be this really full and energetic, brilliant guy to be around. Some days you're having, you know, a, a pretty bad day and stuff. And, and maybe you, you, you don't feel great and you're on a four out of 10 day. And the best version you can bring yourself is a six out of 10 day that day. We'll do that. That's great. And, and the more you do that, the, the more it'll kind of have this, synergistic impact on the people around you 
And it's it's funny the amount of teams I I work with where I say, oh, what's the what's the atmosphere like? And uh, they say, oh, it's great. Obviously, I, I live in Ireland now, so it's great crack. Is what they all say. <laughs> um, and I go, okay. And what do you do to create that? Because it's easy to assume that these kind of really positive environments just happen, right? And you just feed off them. But the reason they're like that is because there are some other guys in that team who are taking that minute before they go in and saying, right, no matter how my day's been, no matter what mood I'm in, I'm going to bring the best version of myself to this. Yeah. And hey, go do the same when you when you go into your, your your studies, your work, go on a date with your girlfriend or boyfriend, go meet friends or family as well. Just just take that moment, and uh, it becomes a habit, and you kind of start breathing a bit more of that positivity. I like that quick little mindfulness exercise. Um, very cool. If you could wave a magic wand, John, and Tomorrow, when all the athletes and around the world wake up, have adopted a new practice of a mental skill, what would you what would you wave the wand and make happen? That's a good question. That one, TJ. Um, I, I suppose selfishly, I think. Well, do do I keep the wand secret because I might put myself <laughs> out of a job if I <laughs> if, if I wave it? But uh, no, I would. Um, I'd, I'd probably say the the ability to always be able to stay in the moment mm. and uh, and have that kind of absolute trust in your decision making your technique your body where you 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 really kind of surrender your consciousness if you will and you and you just trust especially in fast paced sports where you have to react and if you've got to react quickly there's no way you can consciously override that. Your conscious decision might be the right one, but it'll be too slow. You know, it's, um, there's so many sports we play where people are having to react in half a second to see something, perceive something, make a decision, get into position, execute a movement. You try and do that consciously. You can't do it. You know, a bit like when you're learning to drive. Um, when you're learning to drive, everybody's kind of terrible. You're doing these like kangaroo hops down the road um, because you're trying to do it consciously and you're never really in the moment. You're constantly thinking about what to do next or you're evaluating yeah. how you're doing so far. And if I could just strip that out and say, just abandon that and just surrender that sort of consciousness and trust yourself and go with it. And what will be, will be. And, yeah. That, that would be my magic wand thing, I think. I, I like that analogy of the the new driver. I got a, one of your analogies I like, I want to come back to. Um, but kind of unpacking that thought a little bit in being in the moment. I think at least here in the States, it, it seems to almost be sometimes very buzz, buzzworthy. <laughs> you know, okay. You keep, be where your feet are. You, you know, all these, these, these sayings that are, they're cliche because they're correct, but why would a young athlete, when you hear that, be where your feet are, stay in the present moment, why is it such an advantage to us as, you know, not only athletes, but probably, you know, joy in life? Yeah, well, it, from an athlete point of view, I think the main reason it's such an advantage is because it's incredibly hard to do. <laughs> um, we're, we're not wired, right? The, the primary function of the brain essentially is to predict. And a prediction is future focused. And then uh, we, we we analyze all the time. And the minute you start analyzing, you think you, you're in the past. So you're out of the present once again there. And I think um, uh, that would be the huge advantage because no one can really do it, right? And I, and I, look, at, I look at sports teams and think, like the amount of times when you watch uh, any, any, any kind of game really, but especially the kind of field territory games so like football both the american version of football and and, and soccer right and uh, all those kind of games you you get these shifts in momentum and and why does that happen why does the better team not just dominate start to finish it doesn't happen i i'm yet to work with any coach who's on the sideline saying 
guys, we're ahead. Stop doing what you've been doing and let's just try and hold up. Like, they never do that. Some of the fans think they do, but, sure. you know, oh, why, why have we gone all defensive? Why are we sitting back? But it's because that, that thinking about what's to come, thinking about what's gone on so far, that context starts, starts interfering and it interferes with your decisions and you start kind of making these um, fear-based, emotion-based decisions. Um, so I think if you could, if you was able to stay in the moment more, and it's it, it, it's clearly a big advantage because no no one else can really do it. Yeah, yeah. And and in terms of how you do it, I I think that's the that's the really interesting bit because in in my experience, I've kind of come more to the point of thinking like sport. Sport is inherently an emotional experience, right? And that's and that's why we do it. We we love the the uncertainty of it. Like that's that's what makes it exciting. But that yeah. uncertainty creates stress and those kind of things. And there was um, uh, an interview with uh, Rory McIlroy a couple of years ago. the The Open was played at, at Royal Port Rush in right. Northern Ireland, like his home his yeah. home place, and. In the first hole, it was a par four. I think he shot an eight. Um, and the 18th hole of that first round, I think he had a seven or something. Horrific round of golf. Um, and then he did quite well on the second day, but he, he, he just missed the cut by a shot. And when he was interviewed, he said, I'd prepared all the time telling myself, it's just another round of golf. right?" And, and you can see why you would think that. And, and maybe when I was starting out as a, as a sports psychologist, I might have thought that. But that's just so unrealistic because it's yeah. not just another round of golf. Like, yeah. we, you, not you have... Yourself. Yeah, you have these emotional attachments to the venue and the place. and uh, So by thinking it's just another round of golf, he gets on the first tee and he's not ready for that emotional experience. Yeah. Whereas... The more kind of accepting you go, yeah, I'm going to feel many emotions, and 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 to me, emotional control. It's not about it's not about dialing down emotions, but I always I need to come up with a um, a, a newer analogy for this that anybody born at, like later than the 1980s will understand. But you know the old uh, the old hi fi's used to have like the graphic equalizer on with all yeah. these you'd have your bass, treble, volume, and all that kind of stuff. Yep, yep. And, and you had all these dials and you could turn them up and turn them down. And I always think that's what an emotional experience in sport is, right? You've, you've actually got loads of emotions going on at once. Yeah. You have a bit of excitement. You have a bit of fear. You have a bit of anxiety. You have a bit of frustration. They're all there. So emotional control isn't about blocking any of that out, but it's about saying, okay, well, how do I feel? How can I use that? What, what can I do that's going to be most effective here? Which dial do I need to turn up? Yeah. And it's far easier to start turning the emotions up than it is to start turning them down. And that's probably something I've, I've learned and I reflect on some of the earlier advice I gave to people yeah. 15 years ago. Sure. Mm, I wish, I wish I'd known <laughs> more then. Well, one of the analogies I also love in your book and kind of how we can kind of get to the present moment and in those places is, you know, our focus. And you talk about uh, our focus being like a spotlight that's always on. Can you yeah. share, tell the listeners a little bit about that? Yeah. So uh, it, such a common phrase is to say that someone lost concentration. Okay. And I understand why, but uh, I, uh, rather than losing concentration, you didn't lose it. You, you just had it directed on something that wasn't helpful at that moment. So if you think of whether you want to call it attention, attentional control, concentration, whatever works best for you. But if where your attention is, imagine this spotlight is on all the time, never goes off. And sometimes it's, it's really narrow. So imagine like that spotlight, if you were to, if you were to turn it, it would still have the same wattage, the same power, and you put it on a really narrow focus, like hitting a golf ball or something really small, it's this really intense feeling that you get. Sometimes you kind of turn it, the dial the other way and it becomes a much broader spotlight. 
which is useful if you're on a field sport, right? And you're trying to scan and you're trying to see where the space is and where the runs are. But of course, you don't have the same intensity when, when you do that. And then also, I think sometimes you can think of the spotlight rather than being out on the field as a more of an internal spotlight. And sometimes it's in the moment, in the present, where it needs to be. Sometimes it's thinking ahead, what's to come. Sometimes your spotlight's gone behind, but it's always somewhere. So rather than kind of seeing concentration as something that you have at times or you lose, it, it's always there. It's a skill. What we need to be able to do is grab hold of the controls for our spotlight and say, right, I recognize when it's not where it needs to be. And I recognize where I need to be. And I recognize how narrow and intense or broad that, that needs to be. Um, and I, I, I talk a lot, a, a lot to athletes about kind of managing, managing that spotlight rather than kind of just thinking that concentration is this thing that happens, this mysterious thing. I love it. Cause it's like when you say, you know, they, you lost it. And it's like, you know, I could imagine some coach on the sideline, but they lost con- concentration. Mm. And then, you know, the assistant coach going, you know, well, where is it? Is it in the locker room? Is it in the bus? You know, like, <laughs> where, where did we lose it? You know, like, That's it, right? Just like a, you and, know, it's, but it's like, it's, no, it's there. Just fix it. Just. Yeah. And it's, it's probably one of those um, things. It's, uh, I've probably done it as, you know, I, used to work as a football coach as well, like a soccer coach. Mm -hmm. And um, I've probably done it myself where when you're coaching, you shout an instruction that's actually a a pretty complex skill. And we do it with mental skills so often. You know, somebody uh, just misses a tackle or a pass or whatever. And you say, oh, come on, concentrate. As if they're thinking, you may as well have just said, score a goal. Like, uh, like, it's not like I wasn't trying to concentrate, but we, so it's, you, you wouldn't do that with, you wouldn't do that with technical skills, would you? You wouldn't say, play a good pass, not a bad pass. <laughs> like, yeah. you, you would, you'd pick out, okay, well, why wasn't that a good pass? Oh, you, you know, you need to lift your head up, make sure you put enough weight on it, whatever it is, yeah. you give something a bit more instructional. But sometimes with mental skills, we oversimplify them to the point where we just say, do it. <laughs> Always easier said than done. Yeah. Um, I remember a coach who used to say, you've got to be better to me all the time. You've got to be better. Oh, oh. thanks. Yeah. Is that why we're practicing today? Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, he, meant, he meant well. He meant well, I suppose. But, uh, yeah. It, I mean, a lot, I think a lot of coaches, you know, that, they do mean well, but it also shows the importance of the words we use and the impact they have, mm. right? I think you and, notice it. Yeah, and, and on that, one of the things I, I often say to, to players in, in team sports is that communication is a, it's a two-way process, right? You, and sometimes the coach or a teammate or somebody's going to say something that you don't like, but you don't have control over what they say, but your part of that communication is the receiver. You, what you do is you do have an opportunity to say, okay, well, how am I going to take it? Yeah. I, and, and sometimes you can dismiss it. Sometimes you can listen to it. In that instance, when I used to get wound up with this coach, I remember once, I remember I, I was playing on the wing, long ball comes over and I'm thinking, here we go, quick touch, and I'm going to whip a great ball to the back post, Beckham-like. And uh, I got a bit too carried away thinking about what I hadn't yet done, and the ball went under my foot and out of play. And um, he's shouting, Perry, 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 and I'm not looking around. He's the other side of the pitch. I'm thinking, no, 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 I'm, I'm ignoring this. And then eventually, because he, he keeps going, Sorry, that's my dog there. <laughs> um, so he, he keeps shouting. So eventually I look around and that's where he goes, you've got to be better than that. And I'm like, cheers. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. But I suppose years down the line, like that probably annoyed me for a few minutes. And my concentration, my spotlight was on what had happened a few minutes ago and how pissed I was with my coach for not giving me good advice. Whereas now I'd say, 
why did he say that? Because he wants me to play well, right? And that's, that's what I would take from it. I've got a coach who just wants me to play well. That's all he wants. And he's in a stressful position. He, he can't run around the pitch and put his arm on my shoulder. Right. Um, that's what you, your dogs are yelling at. Perry, where are you at? Where are you at? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Do yeah. um, a better interview. <laughs> nah. One of the things you do, uh, don't know much about, but if you could kind of share just a little bit about with the listeners, uh, kind of what they are and, and how you measure them and what, what your work is on them is uh, in the psychometric stuff. Yeah, the psychometrics. So do a lot on psychometrics. I suppose it's, um, there's, there's a lot of psychometrics in existence um, and they're often kind of grossly misunderstood, right? So um, the, the first thing I would say is that not all psychometrics are developed with an intention of being used in an applied setting. A lot of psychometrics are developed as a research tool to measure a pretty narrow psychological construct. Um, now those often, because they're measuring something really narrow, they're good in research because it's easy to replicate them. But measuring something really narrow in an applied setting, it doesn't give you a whole a whole lot. So like with our, with our mental toughness assessment, right, you could... I could give you a score out of 10 of what your mental toughness is, right. you know, okay, then what? So, um, so in an applied setting, we actually want psychometrics that are multidimensional, something that has, you know, maybe four, five, six, seven, eight kind of different sub components to it, because that's going to give me a lot more as an, an applied psychologist to start a conversation with an athlete or a coach um, to raise a few things. And it's not always about saying, oh, here's what you scored on a psychometric. Let's see what we can do in the next three months or six months to, to improve that score. Because you could measure something like personality variables, right? You, by definition, a lot of those personality variables are like enduring and resistant to change. That's, that's what they are. Yeah. Um, if you're if you're an introvert, the aim isn't to turn you into an extrovert. But by knowing that, by understanding a bit more about you as a person, you can go, okay, well, I don't I don't want to turn you into an, an extrovert, but in situations where it would be beneficial to behave like an extrovert, what other skills can we learn? Because it's probably, if you're introverted, you can still behave like an extrovert. It's probably just going to be a bit more tiring for you. Yeah, That's sure. all. Yeah. So that's how I use a lot. And, uh, and in terms of people talk a lot about validity and reliability. And um, it, it's interesting because the, the first thing you see in, in a lot of applied tools is like face validity. This is, it, it feels right. There's an awful lot, an awful lot of, especially personality measures out there that feel right, yet there's virtually no peer-reviewed literature on it. Yeah. Because actually, when you try and test the, the kind of conceptual model, it doesn't work, yeah. right? Sure. So the, a, a good psychometric needs to have that face validity. It does need to make sense to the people that are using it because no one's going to use it otherwise. Um, but look for that peer review research, look for test, retest reliability. If I give somebody the same test in the same conditions in two different occasions, they should get the same score. Otherwise it's not really doing what it's supposed to do. Right. It should, it, it should have content validity. So, um, if, if it was a personality measure, and I'm asking questions that are about introversion or extroversion. All of those questions should be related to each other, but not necessarily strongly related to things that are not part of that subscale. Sure. It should also have construct validity. So it should relate positively to things that we would expect it to and negatively to things it shouldn't. So for mental toughness, one of the tests we did when we developed the questionnaire uh, we've got a recent one, the MTQ plus, um, is saying, well, that should posit that should correlate positively with um, things like 
optimism. It should correlate positively with uh, well-being and it should correlate negatively with depressive symptoms and stress and anxiety. Yeah. So that's, that's the construct. And then the final one that hardly ever gets tested in psychometrics and it drives me insane. <laughs> and I think it's because most people, like I never, I never kind of set out to be really good at psychometrics. I wanted to be really good at like cool stuff. I wanted to be good at football or rock music or whatever, but I kind of just, I got to a point where I thought well, no one's going to pay me to play sport, but like ugh, reluctantly I'm pretty good with the numbers stuff. So I suppose I need to do more of that. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the numbers people are not necessarily applied people. And I think that's why this criterion related validity doesn't happen. So that is, and this is it's so obvious when you explain it. If that questionnaire measures what we're saying it measures, I should be able to predict behaviors with it. So if mental toughness, if our questionnaire actually predicts mental toughness, doesn't, I'm not saying it will predict how good someone is, but if I put somebody in a non-pressurized situation and then I put them in a pressurized situation, the more mentally tough they are, the less their performance will be affected. Whereas the more mentally sensitive they are, you know, they score lower in mental toughness. I would expect their performance to change when the situation gets harder or easier. Sure. Whereas the mental tough performer, you're fine. Right. Because you draw on your own kind of inner strength. You don't really rely on the situation being right. favorable to you. And it's incredible how few psychometrics yeah. actually there's test a, for that kind of stuff. There's a cool, I think it's in uh, Dr. Michael Gervais' audio book. It talks mm-hmm. about something they did with uh, an amateur golfer, a, P- a pro golfer that was like a club pro, and then a tour pro. Mm-hmm. And they put them through some some examples. And, you know, as the stress went up, the pro was able to, you know, bring his heart rate back down, execute, do it at a high level where the weekend warrior and the club pro, as the stress and conditions went up, you know, p- performance yeah, went down. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah. it, you know, it was really cool to kind of see. And uh, it was just made me think of that kind of study as well. Um, fascinating stuff. That's very cool. Uh, one of the things we love to ask uh, in closing, one of our last questions is, uh, how do you define success? Oh, oh, success. Like success, yeah. It's, um, it's, it's a good question. It's probably one that maybe as I'm getting older, um, my, my, my attitude on, on that would have probably changed uh, a bit. Certainly when I was in my, in my 20s, it would have been, uh, well, winning stuff, you know. And then uh, when I was in my 30s, it probably got a, got a, bit, a, a bit broader. And, and now I'm a parent, it probably gets broader again. Like, um, I, I, I would often, it, it, sound, it sounds corny, right? But seeking to maximize every experience. Mm. Yeah. I think if you can do that, I'm not saying you'll achieve all the time. But if you can seek to get the most out of every experience, every interaction, then I would view that as success. And that's not to say that it's just about participation and enjoyment and I don't like winning or whatever, because I've never, I've never quite understood the, the way that people might see enjoying and winning almost as competing demands when I don't know about you, but I love winning. (laughs) And I hate anyone that doesn't. (laughs) So, so I, I, so I, I often think that what I want to do is win. Right. But my aim is just to maximize my experiences because it's more controllable. That's what I can do. I can seek to maximize every experience. And if I think that's what I did both in a, in a social sense, in a performance sense, in a, a well-being sense, then I, I know I know that I gave it my best shot. And you know, to me, that's 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 where I see success now. Thank you for tuning in and all the way to the end. Appreciate that. 
If something this episode caught your ear is useful or unique, I would love if you would share it or, you know, a thumbs up is always encouraging as well. If you want to come back and check out more videos, smash that subscribe button, ring that bell for notifications, and we'd love to have you back. Have a great day and go elevate others.